Did you miss your deadline to renew your Medicaid coverage? You can still send your completed annual review form to Healthy Connections Medicaid. You may be assigned to another health plan, but you can ask to come back to First Choice within 60 days of renewed Medicaid eligibility. It's your family. It's your choice. First Choice is the right choice. Renew and choose us. Visit selecthealthofsc.com slash renew to learn more. With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. All right. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Billy D's podcast. I am absolutely thrilled that you are here. If you have never checked out our program before, we are primarily an interview and a commentary podcast. You can find the Billy D's podcast pretty much anywhere. Podcasts are found to your favorite podcasting platforms. And we want to shout out to all of the fine folks over at Good Pods. That's a podcasting app that you might want to check out. All right. What we're going to do today is we're going to have one of our bonus unconfidentials today. And that's where we kind of take a topic and we just, whether it's current events, what have you, and we just talk about it in a very lighthearted way. And today we're going to talk about the movie Don't Look Up. Now, this isn't going to be one of those critical movie type things where I talk about the actors and the theaters, but what we're going to talk about is what this movie got right in terms of the content that it was presenting. So that's that's coming up. But first, we've had some really good interview episodes recently. Prior to this one, if you look through our playlist prior to this episode, we talked to Christy Mickelson. Now, she is an author, but she is also an advocate for autism awareness and cancer awareness. We talk about a type of cancer during that podcast that you don't normally hear about, and that's kidney cancer. And she incorporates a lot of her advocacy for for the awareness of these things into her writing. She has taken her experiences with those things, how they've impacted her life, and put them into her storytelling. So it, there's a real interesting aspect to that. We're going to have Christy on the program again, if the schedule holds the way that it is next week. And she is going to be with a, another author, and her name is Kat Satava. She is a fantasy author. Now, I hope I have that name right. I have not spoken to Kat yet. We have a pre-production meeting coming up. And then, of course, the interview sometime to get it out next week. So I, I haven't spoken to her yet. But these two, Kat and Christy, are going to be on the podcast together. And given the, the, the really interesting tone that we had with Christy the last time, I'm very much anticipating getting another guest on with her and having a really good discussion. So that's going to be coming up. Very, very soon. All right. Getting to the movie, Don't Look Up. Let's talk a little bit about what that is. It is a movie starring Leonardo DiCaprio and Jennifer Lawrence. Now, there is a lot of support cast in this, including Tyler Perry, Jonah Hill, Meryl Streep, Kate Blanchett. I could go on. There's a number of them in there. And it's kind of maybe a dark humor. Maybe is that the right word? A, sat a satire, maybe? about how in a situation where a comet is heading towards the earth, and of course that's not a new storyline for, for movies, right? But here again, the real kind of take on this is how would we react? What would be 
the reaction of the media? How would they handle it? How would politicians handle it? How would the general public handle it? And this is where the satire kind of comes in. It's it's very much focusing on how social media would talk about the subject. Is it real? Is it a hoax? And so on. How seriously uh, political affiliations are going to handle it? Is it a, it is a, is it a veiled, um, contrived thing to gain control of the population and get people to listen to the government and all these other things? And I was originally told that, oh, I didn't like this movie because it's, you know, it's it's a commentary about how we process the information about global warming. And I don't particularly like preachy movies either, so I wasn't sure what to expect. But I did. I'm going to tell you up front, I did not take that. I, I did not take that away from this movie. Now, this movie doesn't particularly portray anyone. <laughs> In, in a good manner. And I, I get the humor in that because this is here, here's where I'm going to talk about what I feel in, in the spirit of satire. This is going to be what I feel the movie did get right. In today's society, I would certainly believe that it is safe to say we have a distrust of science, especially when it comes to medical professionals and other things. Now we can go down a whole laundry list about some of the things that were right in terms of some of the theories and some of the things that have gone on over the years and some of the things that were wrong. But I just, I do find it odd that it seems cool not to trust what scientists say. And in, in slightly different terms, I, I've always been frustrated about the lack of appreciation for space science. You know, g- getting someone to talk about space these days, there was a time when you could almost strike up a conversation with anyone and talk about the planets and, and, and just how things are going on in, in, in this universe. And uh, somebody would have something interesting to say. And, and now it's, what are you talking about? You know, you, you, it's, I, I find that, it, you know, these are my own experiences. You almost have to get involved with communities or groups of people who, who share these interests. It doesn't seem in social situations that you run across this too, more, too much. And this is true when it comes to supporting what we spend on space with NASA and other things. It's almost like, people. why do we need to go to space? You know, we have problems down here. And here again, I understand where that's coming from, but there's some, there's at least two things that are really wrong when somebody says that. And and the first one is, and of course, here again, this is my opinion, but the first thing that, that's wrong about this is the idea that we haven't gained any knowledge that's made our lives better through our exploration of space. The space program is one of the things that has paid off our investment, the dividends that have come from a a space exploration to me are, there's too many to count. In terms of technology, in terms of microprocessors, in, in terms of communications, in terms of satellites, the medical advances, the things that we've learned about the human body. Uh, firefighting, fire retardant uh, materials, firefighting methods, aerodynamics for airplanes and the safety features thereof, weather prediction. You know, I, I could go on and on the new materials, new types of, of, of metals and things that uh, are stronger and more resistant to heat. And, and all of these things have benefited the world in which we live in, and dare I say the economy. Okay, so it's, it's helped our way of life. It's helped us with medical knowledge. It's helped us with a safety, and it has broken wide open new marketplaces for communications and satellite communications and GPS and so many things. To suggest that the space program hasn't helped us is very naive. It, it's not well researched at all. And the other thing that I don't like about that statement, well, there's other things, you know, down here that we need to be taken care of. 
is that it leads, it, it feeds the premise that our earth is kind of this little biodome and our world ends at the top of the atmosphere. And what happens out there is far away and removed from us. We only, we're only concerned about what's happening under the blue sky. You know, some of us have different opinions about whether or not global warming is happening or if pollution is having an effect, a man's presence on earth or, or all of these things. We, we, we can all have that argument, but everybody is working under the assumption that that this earth is just this little isolated ball and space is something else. When the fact of the matter is, is that space is part of our world. Everything that's under our feet, even the molecules in our body, are products of things that came from space. It's, it's an ongoing thing. Okay, this, uh, this idea that our world ends at the top of our atmosphere is, is not true. There's things that are happening in space today that are impacting our world. And we're the product of things that have happened in, in space before. And there's a lot of things in space and the exploration thereof that will enhance our world. And when I say our world, I just don't here again, I just don't mean the earth. I mean, our place in the solar system, our place in the universe, our world doesn't end at the top of the atmosphere. Okay, it's part of, of a much larger expansion that we should be learning from and taking advantage of. And that's the part of the movie that I feel was right on the money because I've been talking about this. As a matter of fact, you can check through my playlist. There's a lot of podcast episodes that I have talked about why space is important. It's, 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 it's an important subject to me. I've covered this before and I sometimes feel like um, I'm talking in, in, until I'm blue in the face. You can probably hear my frustration. It's so important in terms of scientific advancement and how we consider our place in the universe, how we consider our humanity. It's such an important big part of the picture that the general public just does not appreciate a lot of the times. So I, I believe the, the movie is, is right there. Okay. Now I am not a professional space scientist, but I do enjoy physics and there's a lot of science in space besides physics. I mean, there's chemistry, there's geology, there's all kinds of things, you know, going on. And as somewhat of an enthusiastic amateur in terms of my interest in these subjects, I can tell you that the movie is also right in terms of how they presented this comment. In the movie, there's like a warning window of six months. They find this comment. They recognize the fact that it's on a collision course with earth. And we have about six months to act upon it. Now, generally speaking, those, that premise is true. Okay. There are a lot of comets out there. Comets are basically chunks of dust, rock, and ices. Okay. And these cosmic snowballs, they, there's so many of them. We're not even sure how many of them. We've identified several thousand, three or four thousand, some odd uh, comets, but there's a lot of them out there. And they come from what's called the Kuiper Belt and the, the Oort Cloud. Now, the reason you don't have much warning on this is because of the fact there's so many of them. And they really don't have very clear, defined, structured orbits. With some objects, we, we can notice a pattern of where this thing is going. And we can, we can, you know, roll out the scenarios with our computer programs and things like that and figure out like in 20 years, in the year 2043 or whatever, you know, this thing is going to come really close. But with comets... 
about the time you've done the math, you've noticed it and you've done the math, you have a very short window. Okay, that's actually, this is all pretty much true. So those two things I would give the movie, I, I, I would give the fact that it plays on the fact that we've lost our appreciation and respect for science. And number two, I would say that the presentation of how this comet could threaten the earth is for the most part realistic. This isn't something that's just a wild science fiction fantasy. This, the premises of this movie are, are fairly sound. And here again, getting people to believe that <laughs> may not be so easy. Getting back to this distrust of science, there seems to be this anti-science structure that presents itself as some pseudo-intellectualism. And, and I'm referring to the people who are the flat earth people, who are the hollow earth people. And uh, somebody kind of disagreed with me the other day. I, I, I was speaking about it and they said, Bill, oh, come on. All right. Yes, there's people who believe that the earth is flat, but there's not too many of them. We're taking them and we're exaggerating their influence. And I'm not so sure about that. I don't know what some of the scientific studies in terms of polls have done recently. How many people actually believe that the earth is flat? But I can tell you socially, I run into them now much more than I ever did when I was young. And if you follow some of these people online, you'll find there's these groups of people who have these very detailed uh, plans and assertions about these conspiracies to hide the fact that the earth is flat and they have all these diagrams and all the all this math involved it's almost in some weird fashion believable okay and they have thousands of followers they have thousands uh, of people who feed into this notion and like i said i, I i'm not sure it's almost like we're going backwards we're going backwards in, in terms of our scientific knowledge. It's not evolving, it's devolving. And it, it, it's, it's very frightening. To me, it's, it, that's a good word. It's actually frightening. That people could turn away from the obvious that much and bury themselves in a bunch of created, distorted data it's it's very strange so with that being said this lack of support for the sciences and our opinions starting to mold what science is all about what concerns me in this movie is as a subtext to that the portrayal of billionaire entrepreneurs, billionaire business people who have been investing in space, the portrayal of these individuals in this movie is kind of, they're, they're odd characters. They're kind of strange. They're all about money. They don't want to do anything in terms of helping what's going down in the rainforest. They want to go to space and it's all about, you know, some Freudian thing about building these big rockets because they're really not, you know, endowed in any other way. And this feeds into a lot of the criticism that these business people get. And here again, I'm not defending them. I'm not saying they're saints and by any stretch of the imagination. But here is where I am going with this. Given that there hasn't been a whole lot of support in the United States for a viable space program, either from the public or from Congress or anything else. We've kind of haven't had a forceful leader or anybody who has proclaimed the humanity of our existence in space. We haven't had that type of a leader since Kennedy. Okay. The Apollo program, after that was over, the space program kind of limped along. But there really hasn't been much going on there. The old 
Soviet Union, uh, the new Russia, let's say, that space program isn't anywhere near what it once was in the 1960s and 70s. It's pretty much gone. Okay. China does have a space program. I don't know how it compares to what the United States is doing. Um, But where I'm going with this is let's say that tomorrow morning we turn on the news and we find out that some nerd out in the middle of nowhere with a telescope has found an object and it's heading our way. It's going to be here in four months. All right. Now, here's my question. Who has the capability to do something about it? NASA? Maybe. I would hope they would have some ideas. (laughs) China? Well, maybe. I don't know. Russia? Probably not. UK? Probably not. Nothing in that short amount of time. So where do we go from here? It's probably going to be one of those billionaires. One of those billionaires who already has an investment in deep space rockets and already has an investment in the technology and could most certainly work with NASA and do something about it. It could be that one of these rich billionaires saves life as we know it. And that's not as far out as it seems. And if you would disagree with me on that, I respect your opinion. But what I would ask is, well, what is the plan going to be? If it happens tomorrow, what's the plan? What do we do? And here again, this is something that in terms of our appreciation for science, something we have to respect. There have been very large impacts on the earth already. And we kind of have a tendency to dismiss it because certainly in modern times, there hasn't been a a cataclysm of that type. But you got to keep in mind that human civilization has only been here a very short time and we have a tendency to evaluate the length of events the length between events in terms of their comparison to human lifetimes all right and let's say the last 10,000 years is when we've had what we would call human civilization appear on earth 50,000 years ago, there was an impact in Arizona. And we know that in, in terms of millions of years, there's been very significant impacts that have altered the path of life on Earth. Okay. And when you start taking in the age of the Earth as 4. billion, some of these impacts are relatively frequent, okay? And that's the, the, the hard part about gauging. A, a lot of people on the other side of the coin have said, well, why don't we do something? Why don't we build some rockets now? Why don't we do something to have them ready? Because it could happen. And I appreciate that, but here's, here is an, a, a legitimate problem with that, and it's not just spending the money. The problem is, is we don't know exactly what those circumstances are going to be. How big is it going to be? What direction is it going to be? Is is it something we're going to have to design a rocket that will deflect its course? Or is it something that we can blow apart with nuclear warheads or whatever? So we don't know what we're dealing with until we face it. Okay, so my, my best suggestion is we have to have the capability to develop our best technology immediately. We have to stay on top of our best technology all the time because we, we never know when we're going to have to put it to work. Okay, so I, I don't believe that we can sit on our hands. But it is true that we could spend billions of dollars, let's say, on a rocket that may be useless in terms of whatever comes down the road, for one thing. And it is possible that... Whatever is going to come and significantly alter, uh, alter life on Earth may, be, may happen 10,000 years from now. 
Okay, so we could build this thing. It would become antiquated in a couple of years in terms of how technology advances. And then it would just be sitting here and probably never get used. Okay, but by the same token, we could have an impact from something that we haven't caught at any time. So you have this extreme of, of it could happen at any time. It could happen 10,000 years from now. So it's it's harder than what it seems to manage. It's 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 a hard concept to manage, but it's something that we need an appreciation for because threats from space aren't limited to flying rocks. There's potentially radiation bursts. There's other things that we have to be monitoring the skies for. And when I say the skies, not just the blue one, but everything around us in our solar system here, again, it's, it's all potentially very impactful because this is part of our existence. This is part of our world. This space is part of our world. And we should be monitoring things that are happening in and around it all the time, not only for flying rocks, but for potentially radiation bursts and, and other things, gamma rays, all these things. Some of these things that seem kind of far out and may never happen in our lifetimes could potentially be a big problem, let's say, this summer. All it takes is that one discovery that was portrayed in this movie and all of a sudden our existence, our, our one of the parts about the, the movie that kind of made me very sad was they had this towards, and I, I don't want to give it away, but towards the end of the movie, they had all these little flashes of hippopotamuses and other things and and the oceans and the birds and, and just the idea that that could all be gone is very, very sad. I mean, it's uh, it's almost too awesome to talk about. It's real. It's possible. And that is what makes it scary. It may not happen during our lifetimes, but it could. And that part of the movie is something that those two things, I believe it's very fair in how it presents our distrust of science, our lack of appreciation for anything regarding space and, and the space sciences. That to me was a very fair criticism that was portrayed in this movie. but. Here again, I, 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 I wouldn't be too quick to criticize some of these billionaires who have these, these flights planned because it could come in handy just in case. You dig what I'm saying? Just in case. All right. Do check it out. I enjoyed the movie. Don't look up. And here again, that's starring a Leonardo DiCaprio. And he's one of those... He's one of the few stars. There used to be a time when this was more common, but he is one of the few stars that can bring people out to check out a movie before they know what the movie's about. Okay, there's his presence in a movie alone can bring people out. And you don't have that too much anymore. Tom Cruise, maybe a little bit with the Mission Impossible series and all that. They, you know, people know, they don't have to know what any one of those particular movies is about. They just know it's going to have a lot of action in it. He's going to be doing a lot of stunts and they want to go check it out. And, and there might be a few others. But for the most part, that kind of star power is very rare. Special effects are another thing entirely. A lot of the new movies that are out today, quite frankly, look like very good video games. but Star power is something that um, is kind of, is starting to wane. And he still has some of that. Jennifer Lawrence as well. I really like her as an actress and, and a person. I believe that this movie was well acted. It didn't have the feel of a big budget movie. It, it, here again, it's, it's on Netflix. I, 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 from what I understand, there were some theatrical releases of it. But it doesn't have that big movie feel. It very much has... A television movie feel, in my opinion, a television movie feel around it. Maybe a little bit more than that, but but you get what I'm saying. It's it's not sold on the idea that it's this big budget movie, this epic. It's not that. It's actors portraying characters in a way that is satirical. 
in a way that is a commentary in a lot of ways that I feel is very accurate about our society today. Do check it out. Don't look up the movie. And uh, absolutely, if you have an opinion about this, you want to let me know about it, by all means, you can tweet me. Real easy to find on Twitter, at Billy D's. It would be great to hear from you. Hey, next week, those interviews I was telling you about, do check them out. They're all heading your way. I'm Billy D's. Thanks for listening to the podcast, and we'll talk again next week. Well, hello, everyone. I am Billy D's from the self-titled Billy D's podcast. You can find me on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, and many more of the best podcast networks. Join me for my commentary and interviews. Follow me on Twitter, really easy to find, at Billy D's. I am Billy D's. I'd love to have you listen in. Okay, round two. Name something that's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah, oh, sorry. We were looking for Chumba Casino. That's right. ChumbaCasino.com has over 100 casino style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. ChumbaCasino.com. No purchases, over prohibited by law, 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. 